How good are your changeovers? How good are your people at setting up equipment? It really doesn't matter what type of environment you're in. If you're dealing with a construction site with uh, large equipment, if you're dealing with landscaping, a restaurant, a hospital, or a manufacturing environment, you probably have to deal with setups and adjustments. And if you're not using the tool, the lean tool of quick changeover, I guarantee you're dealing with greater waste and frustration connected to those activities than you really need to be. Hi, Ryan, before you're with Black Bell Lean Thinking. I want to give you a brief tutorial on quick changeover. I have a lot of experience with this lean tool and it is a lean tool that can give you a lot of bang for your buck for the time that you invest in quick changeover there's a lot of waste and frustration you can eliminate I have taught this class on quick changeover to my estimation well over a hundred times during the seven years that I was a senior trainer with Phillips Lighting and I've been part of many uh, SMED single minute exchange of dye or quick changeover projects, Kaizans, many events, and I've seen firsthand again how powerful this tool is. I saw large assembly lines go from 24 hour for changeover or 12 hours down to, in some cases, around 10 minutes. So it's pretty amazing what you can accomplish. And this gives you a setup, a framework like most lean tools that you can follow. Like most lean tools, there's a framework that you follow when you're doing quick changeover that makes it really desirable and easy to use. Uh, when I took over teaching this class, it was originally an eight hour class and I got it down to four hours, which kind of made sense. We're talking with something you can do quickly. And the steps that you follow with quick change are pretty simple, simple and they make a lot of sense. They're very self-evident when you're working with these. One of the things I would suggest, as I do with all lean implementation, is that if you have no experience in your factory dealing with lean, get with others who have used these tools before. You don't want to take a cookie cutter approach because there are times when it's okay to break the rules when it comes to lean. You want to understand the principles what you're dealing with and if you have someone that's implemented these before and can understand your environment and how to apply these uh, these tools then again you can save you a lot of frustration right there one of the things I would suggest is look in your community for other organizations that are doing lean if they have quick changeover that they've been doing for a while you know you can learn a lot from them no reason to reinvent the wheel okay that being said what we're going to do is we're going to go to my desktop and I'll take you through a tutorial on the basics of quick changeover. Again, I think what you're going to see is the steps are pretty easy and pretty self-evident. It's, it's very easy to follow. One of the things that I would recommend though is you, you keep a very open mindset as you go through these with your people. Again, you want to, and I'll explain this in the slides, you want to have a scientific approach in that you're dealing with hypothesis there's no right or wrong as long as it doesn't break the rules of, or laws of physics you know or the laws of man or God you know you can probably try for it but let your people come up with hypothesis for improving your changeover and set of time and then you know go after and test it this framework will help you to be able to do that so much better all right here we are at my desktop and let's look at quick changeover a brief tutorial on quick changeover and um, what really benefits you can look at getting from it. Um, we tend to be benefits oriented, as I've mentioned in most videos. Uh, you're not going to get your people excited or really involved and engaged in anything if they don't see the benefits. And if not, you're not using quick change um, tool, uh, if you're not using quick change, then you're, I guarantee you're losing opportunity and your people are working harder at setups and changeovers and things along this line than, than really is needed. So later on in the video we'll cover all these benefits. We'll review understanding how quick changeover setup reduction supports lean manufacturing, which it really does. It's an excellent tool. Understanding key concepts related to quick changeover setup reduction. Learn the principles of SMED 
As I mentioned, there's a framework and there's a very easy to follow guidelines for it. Learn to apply SMED using a disciplined visual process of documentation and improvement. So again, we want a framework to follow. We want standard work and we always want to know where we're at. We, we have to know our current state and what the goals are. Uh, experience a team approach to quick changeover setup reduction. Remember, lean is based on two things, people and processes. So we want to give and empower the people with the processes they need to be successful in all that they do. A great definition of lean. A systematic approach to identifying and eliminating waste. These are all the non-value added activities. Through continuous improvement by flowing the product at the pull of the customer in the pursuit of perfection. Uh, I love these kind of long-winded definitions when we're talking about something lean, but this is an excellent definition and it captures all the key points that involve lean. Okay, value added, non-value added. Very important for your team to understand these. Remember, for something to be value added from the customer's perspective, it has to meet three criteria. It's got to be valued by the customer and that is something a customer is willing to pay for. It has to change the form or function of the product in some way. And it's got to be done right the first time. Um, if you look at changeovers, uh, maintenance, things of this nature, from the customer's perspective, they are not value added because they don't meet those three criteria. So changeovers are non-value added. We want to minimize those or eliminate them. Uh, get them as, as minimal as possible. Uh, typically, when we look at lead, and lead time, and remember, lead time can be defined as from the point where you get the order to where your customer receives a product or service and you get paid. That's a lead time. Studies show that waste eats up about 95% of lead time. That's why with a, a lean operation, uh, you are looking for those eight forms of waste and doing your best to remove those. And again, single minute exchange of dice met or quick changeover, just one of those tools that you're gonna use. Okay, let's look at a quick changeover and how it eliminates waste. There's kind of a chain of events that happens. So there's a look at the top. Okay, we've got reducing changeover time requires advanced preparation. That's true. It's like you're designing a pit stop for NASCAR. So we're going to invest some time in training and organization. But what that's going to do is it's going to reap us a lot of continuous rewards. Advanced preparation increases changeover accuracy. Increased changeover accuracy reduces defects in trial processing. You know, trial processing and defects can eat up a lot of resources, you know, every time we do a changeover or every time we do a, a setup or bring up equipment. Reducing trial processes reduces time, effort, material waste, and frustration. Okay, the next line, reducing changeover time reduces the need for long production runs. As our changeovers get more accurate and shorter, we don't need long runs. Short runs reduce overproduction and increase flexibility. Reducing overproduction reduces inventory and lowers space requirements. Reducing changeover time reduces non-value added time. Remember, all changeovers and setups from the customer's perspective are non-value added. Reducing non-value added time shortens overall lead time. Shorter lead time enables faster response to customer's needs. Again, we always want to be shortening that lead time from the time where you get the order and the customer gets their product or service and you get paid. We want to sh continually work at shortening that time. Okay, let's look at those benefits again. Shorten the lead time. Again, um, we need to constantly be looking at re removing waste and shortening that lead time. Less material waste. As we come better with changeovers, we'll experience less material waste in that trial processing when we come up. And again, that's that fewer defects as part of that. Less inventory. If you've got long changeovers, um, say it takes six to eight hours to change over a piece of equipment, you'll try and balance that out by keeping a large inventory so you don't have to change it over very often. If you can get that changeover down to a matter of a few minutes, then you only change over when you need it and you only produce what is needed. Lower space requirements, large inventory means lots of storage room. Higher productivity, 
again all that is to you know meet that requirement of uh, you got a long time that's needed for changeover so you're going to keep a long inventory so you don't have changeover very often greater flexibility if you get your changeover down to minutes then we'll see as we look as I walk you through this presentation how you're able to really become so much more flexible okay when Toyota really came up with uh, the model of showing the house of lean they had a lot of people that were asking about the Toyota productive system and they came up with this model as just a way of explaining it quick changeover is part of the foundation it is a very important tool and um, something you definitely want to spend time investing in okay let's look at why we end up with long runs due to long changeovers um, when Mr. Shingo really got into looking at uh, studying SMED and, and change over time with Toyota, they had presses with dies uh, that really took over six hours to change over. So when you have a part that takes that long or process takes that long to change over set up, you don't want to do it very often. So you'll change over and you'll produce for maybe a, a you know, a, a day or two you know producing bigger inventory than you really need to but it offsets the time invested in that changeover so you use something called EOQ or economic order quantities to balance that out again a lot of time for the changeover we're going to produce a lot of product to minimize that so this kind of shows that equation the longer the changeover time the usually the, the greater the inventory we're going to produce to make up for it but if we can reduce that change over time then there's no need to keep those long large inventories um, we'll change over when we need to we'll produce what we need and then we'll just change over to the next product you know a, a lot of our frustration in large inventories and that that thinking of having to do large batches goes away when we talk about quick changeover Often we use NASCAR pit stops as kind of the benchmark, and with good reason. When I outline the framework that makes up a good, solid, quick changeover, uh, you'll see that uh, really all of it is utilized in NASCAR. If you look at 1980, NASCAR pit stop took 60 seconds or over a minute. Today, it's an average of 14 seconds, a 76% improvement. The way they did this, someone uh, in one crew had the idea of gluing on the lug nuts so that they're already on the wheel when you put it on, this break it loose with the, uh, the power tool and it goes right on. So they eliminated a lot of steps. One of the things that we are looking to do with uh, how we, we framework our setups and our changeovers is eliminate as much motion and transportation as possible and we'll look at things that we can do with the equipment still running to set up again like that that nascar pit stop they are getting ready for the car while the car is still on on the racetrack you know driving around um while the car is on the track racing the pit crew gets everything set so they can maximize the the amount of downtime with that car they have the tires there, they have the tools, they have the gas, everything is ready. We want to treat our equipment the exact same way. We want to do everything we can to prepare while the equipment is up and running. So when it goes to, go, so that when we shut it down, we're ready to rock and roll. Okay, I mentioned that there's a lot of flexibility that can be gained because of quick changeover. And this kind of demonstrates that. In this factory environment, they had uh, two hour changes every day that they had to perform. So that ate up 10 hours of time for changeovers. That left them 30 hours for running and they had no free time. Now they got involved in SMED and were able to get those changeovers down from two hours down to three minutes. That may seem to you like quite a stretch, but it really is not. Uh, I have been part of many SMED activities in different factory environments and I've been part of uh, changeover activities where we have started with, say, lines that took 12 hours or longer to change over, and we were able to get them down to under an hour and, in some cases, under 10 minutes. So it is uh, amazing what you can do when you start using this quick changeover framework. So from two hours to three minutes is doable in a lot of cases. One of the things I would say is 
Um, don't go for the, you know, uh, doing it and doing the changeover in under 10 minutes. That's great. But what you're looking for is to con continually improve. So wherever you're at with your changeovers now, that's your benchmark. That's, you know, where you're at your baseline. You want to continually improve on that. And if you can only improve it by, say, an hour or whatever, fine, but keep working at it, keep improving. So they went from two hours to three minutes. And now with their changeovers every day, they are only spending 15 minutes rather than 10 hours. They've got their 30 hours that they needed for protection, but they basically freed up almost 10 hours. So they decided to do more changeovers. Again, with it only taking three minutes to change over, why not do more? They can produce better to demand. So now they're doing five changeovers in a day. And that's only eating up 75 minutes. They got their 30 hours for production running. And they still have about nine hours of free time. So again, there's incredible doors that are opened in terms of flexibility by having better control of your changeovers. OK. When we look at changeover time, usually what we're t talking about is the time between the last good piece off the current run and the first good piece off the next run. I usually stretch that out and say not just the first good piece, but when the line is running stable and you're consistently producing good product. So you don't want to run for a bad shift, say, after a changeover, just trying to debug and stabilize. You want to be able to come up and cruise. So now we're starting to get into the, the meat and potatoes of the process of actually doing a Kaizen connected to or centered around SMED, a single minute exchange of die or quick changeover. So we want to document the current changeover. <clears throat> we want to see the baseline, where we're at today. Then we're going to analyze that changeover. We're going to come up with ideas to improve it. We're going to implement them and we'll monitor it and make corrections as we go. So you want to put together your Kaizen team. Pick what I would suggest is one piece of equipment. There are really only two ways to implement a new program. You can go a mile wide and an inch deep. Let's try and teach the entire factory this, you know, which is a pretty big battlefront and kind of hard to support. Or we can go an inch, inch wide and a mile deep. Let's pick one department and one piece of equipment. We'll implement this improvement, you know, again, 5S plus 1, TPM, SMED, whatever, and we'll let it sell the rest of the factory as people see the great improvements that we made through this one lean tool in this one small area. So put together your team. What I would suggest uh, for this Kaizen uh, around, around quick change is pick people connected with the equipment you're going to do the changeover with. So you want people that work on that equipment, mechanics, operators, anyone that's connected to it. Okay, we're going to document the settings when the equipment is running good. So pick a normal day when it's running optimal and what are any settings you can get hammered down. You know, where we want to minimize the amount of adjusting we do when it comes up. So capture anything we can capture. Okay, you want to maybe have a meeting and assign activities and tasks and make sure that everyone is on the same page on what we're trying to accomplish. And that's really, at this point, capturing a good baseline of a changeover so that we can study it and drive improvements. This is a changeover observation chart. You can download templates or create your own off, off the internet. Just, you know, you can create your own using Excel. But as we observe the changeover, e either by videotaping or just watching, we want to write down every step that happens. If we try and use a flow chart, uh, it's easy for people to miss steps or forget. But if you're videotaping and then watching as a group, you can capture everything. So that's one of the things I'll talk about here in a moment. But you want to be able to document each step so you can analyze it. You want to create kind of a war room or a, a center where everyone can see this information that's tied to the project. You know, any of the stakeholders or even management. But uh, and if you have an intranet, you can put this on. That's fine. But you just want to have all the information where people can see it. This is like scoreboard at a soccer game. It will drive behavior. When people understand where they're at today, where we need to get to or what the goal is, and where what we're doing, you know, all the, the project uh, at this point, then it helps to 
drive us to uh, really get a sense of urgency and improve it. It's in our human nature. We are performance oriented. If we have a task that we're involved in, we want to move it forward. We want to improve. Okay, I mentioned videotaping. Uh, I've done a lot of videotaping of changeovers. Um, this is where you get a chance to go out there and make your own movie, your own little Blair Witch project. And you really want to uh, take a good video cam out and film two perspectives. One is the wide angle look. So you're going to set up your camera, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 feet out and capture as much space as you can. And what you're doing is you're looking at all the wide movement. So how many times do people leave the value field, leave the equipment? to go get tools, parts, information. We want to minimize that. Again, that's motion and transportation, which is a waste. Then you want a close-up view where you're capturing what's happening between our shoulders and our hands. Are people doing a lot of wrenching? Are, you know, are there excessive bolts and nuts and things of this nature where you could remove a lot of that with clamps and quick connects and anything that minimizes that amount of wrenching? So you want to be able to do this videoing. Okay, as I mentioned, I've done a lot of this, and it's amazing what you uncover. One of the first lines I went out to, to video, videotape a changeover, um, it was going to take an entire shift to change this assembly line. So I asked the lead mechanic if uh, they had a check sheet they followed. He assured me they did. And uh, I told them to signal me when they were ready to begin. He did, and I started filming. Within five minutes, they were jammed up. They had uh, loosened some bolts and started to move the line in. Um, they're doing a length change, and the equipment bound up and wouldn't move. Now, they're getting frustrated walking around trying to see where it's bound and make it worse. They know I'm catching everything on film. So this is adding to their frustration. And sure enough, they found a guard that wasn't removed that needed to and is binding up the line. When I later pulled out the check sheet and looked at it, about the third or fourth step down was remove this guard. So they had the check sheet, but they weren't following it. And we found a, a lot of other mistakes along that line. Again, it's important to have a check sheet and it's important to follow it. But videotaping is a great way to capture everything. And then you can watch the videotape as a team and capture all these ideas onto your observation form. Okay, after we've done that, we're starting to analyze things, you know, to drive improvements. Let's look at the environment that we're doing the changeover in. Do you have good workplace organization? Do you have 5S, good visual controls? If you don't have these, I would say put a quick change on hold and implement these tools first. It's going to be really hard to implement TPM or quick changeover if you haven't first done 5S. We need good organization. Uh, it would be like having a, a clean piece of paper before you start writing a note on it. And you see this toolbox where, again, it's very easy to tell with this type of environment if a tool is missing. Um, you don't want to waste any time looking for things. Again, that's excessive motion and time waste. So here are the steps for 5S plus 1. Again, sort through, scrub and clean, secure safety, select the locations that are you know, close to the point of use that minimize motion that are close to the value fields. Then set these locations by putting borders and labels around them, and then sustain it by having audits. But make sure 5S is in place first before trying to tackle some of the other lean tools. Again, 5S is a foundation tool. Here's another great example of blending 5S or organization with an improvement for quick change. What this line did was they had a different changeovers and they color coded the bolts to go with the equipment for that particular type of changeover. It'd be like yellow is for one product, blue is for another, red is for a different one, and dark blue yet for another product. Uh, one of our assembly lines did this very thing. So they knew when changing over for this product they grabbed all the parts that were painted orange on top. So again, great visuals to help speed things up. In one of the tool cribs in one of our factories, the people that worked in the tool crib came up with this idea. All the tools you see on that board are tools that people would check out. Uh, the only way that our people at the tool crib would know they were checked out is by looking at the, the list, you know, the 
sign out sheet. By having this board they created, it was a tremendous visual. They could instantly see if something was missing. So towards the end of the shift, they could call whoever had checked it out and ask them to you know, bring it back if they were done with it. So I, I would tease them that it was uh, not only a great visual tool, but uh, something they were proud of and kind of a work of art. Okay, when Mr. Shingo with Toyota came up with the idea of single minute exchange of die, they had several large presses with Toyota that it took hours to change out. Uh, they had these huge dies that had to be swapped out and it would take in excess of six hours. So he wanted to bring it down to under 10 minutes. So that was the challenge that he brought to everybody. In changeovers, when he was doing his studies, this is the amount of time that he, he, this is the amount of time that was dedicated to different activities. So preparation time took out about 30% of the changeover time. Then parts removal and attachment was about 5%. Then centering, dimensioning, setting, you know, took 15 and trial processing and adjusting, dialing things in, debugging, took about 50%. And that 50%, that is so critical because, you know, when we're debugging like that, that's when we're wasting material, uh, raw materials. We're using resources like electricity. And this is when people get hurt is, you know, when we're trying to bring up and, and debug equipment. Uh, often people are have to run the equipment to debug, so they're interacting with maybe with moving parts. So anything we can do to come up quicker, and with a more accurate uh, setup, then we can minimize a lot of this, make it go away. There are two types of changeover tasks, and we want everyone to be able to recognize these. They're internal, when the machine is down, and external, what you do when the machine is running. If we go back to our NASCAR example, this would be what could the pit crew do while the car is still on the racetrack versus what they need the car to be able to actually do. So while the car's on the racetrack, they can get the tires, they can grab the gasoline, they can grab the tools. It would be really weird to watch a NASCAR pit stop where the car pulled in and then the guys leave to go pick up the tires. You know, we want everything at the point of use and ready to go as soon as that equipment goes down. When we videotape and then we capture all the activities, what we first thing we want to do is we want to assign each of those activities. Are they internal or external? Do they have to be done when the equipment is down or can they be done while the equipment is still running? Once we've done that and separated, then we want to streamline or find the best ways to do all those activities. Just by going through and looking at all the activities and assigning them as internal or external, and switching as many internal as you can do external, and then looking for you know, any way to streamline these, just by doing that alone, you'll usually experience a 30 to a 50% reduction in your change over time. That's amazing. And I love watching teams when they first get experience doing this because that's so amazing just in itself. We're just, you know, just really into the project, the Kaizen project of reducing this change over time. And we've already given it much better structure and identified really some good improvements with very little work. All we've done really is observe and, um, you know, make some better decisions on how we, we approach it. Three things we want to utilize to help us with our uh, quick changeover are checklists, functional checks, and then minimizing transportation and motion. Okay, so let's look at checklists. I mentioned that, uh, you know, that line I was filming and they had a checklist, but they weren't using it. Okay, once we've identified all the activities and we've streamlined the best way to approach these, then we want to create a checklist. Again, we want a, a good standard to follow, like a recipe, so that everyone knows up front. Again, this is our pit crew. We need to make sure everyone knows their parts and we have everything that we need in terms of tools, parts, and information. Okay, functional checks is something also that will save you a lot of time. What functional checks mean is anything that you're going to use prior to the equipment being down, make sure it's in good functional order. It's working fine. You don't know how many times I've seen 
subassembly swapped out of equipment only to find that the subassembly uh, is just as bad as the bad one they took off. So you might have a, uh, something that's got a lot of moving parts or a gearbox or you know blades or whatever and you swap them out without checking them and you find out the blades are dull. You know this gearbox is no good. So anything you can check before swapping it out with the equipment, do so. You'll save yourself a lot of time and frustration. Again, not everything is 100%. So do your best to check equipment and tools before putting them into use. And transportation. Um, you want point of use storage. Again, think of that pit stop at, with NASCAR. You know, when that car comes to a stop, you want everything you need right there to service it. So anything you can do with your mechanics, lead mechanics, uh, your, your people that are actually involved in a changeover, make sure they have changeover carts or parts, tools, information right there at the point of use. That's a goal. We are always looking to minimize transportation and minimize motion. This is a picture of a cart that was used for changeovers. Uh, in many of the factories I worked in, we had lots of different changeover carts. We had some of our electricians used with just different types of wires and tools they needed that they would take out to the different lines. So, you know, create carts based on the activities you're going to use the equipment to perform. But again, it's a great way to minimize the amount of motion, and especially the type where people are leaving the value field, leaving the equipment to go uh, grab things. Okay, as I mentioned before, just by identifying all the activities and making uh, a distinction between internal and external, and then switching as many internal as we can to external, you, know, you will harvest a big time savings right there. We're going to prepare, standardize all this, and I'll, I'll talk to you more about having intermediary jigs. Jigs are just, you, you're you using something to set up so you can avoid adjusting if you can. And that's the beauty of jigs. Again, if you can use something where you've got uh, a bolt or a pin or something people can go right to, rather than have to do a bunch of adjusting, it's definitely desirable. It's like having a clamp rather than bolts. You don't want to do a bunch of wrenching if you can avoid it. So the preparation, again, it's like that uh, NASCAR pit stop. Let's get prepared in advance while the car's on the track. Get everything we need, get it all set up. You know, once we've got all this going, let's standardize everything. You know, decide what is uh, the essential functions that have to happen. I've already mentioned what's uh, on this slide, but uh, I want to leave these slides in place so that again you you got them and can view them. So again, like the NASCAR pit stop, we want to take the time to prepare. We want to create the checklist and standard standardize everything that we're doing. Again, we don't want to slay these dragons with every changeover. Now I mentioned the jigs. Anything you can do where you can eliminate or minimize your your wrenching, your adjusting, your setups. You know, you're really better off to do that. So come up with scry marks, pins, anything that puts you immediately into a place where you don't have to adjust. You know, on this, this press, the, where you see the arrow, they had created these plates that eliminated the adjustment. The presses went on, or the dies went on these plates. Um, when they were swapping dies out, they just uh, used the plate and it had already adjusted the height to the setting they needed. So it eliminated all the adjustments. Parallel operations, I can think of one line we had where uh, there were four sections that were identical. And I used to be a mechanic on that particular line and when we would change over to certain products, it might take me 30 minutes to an hour per section. So that's two to four hours just changing out that. Um, what we did was we had two mechanic working rather than just me, so now that cut the amount of time in half. Then by using really the tools I'm showing you right now with lean, um, going to quick clamps and things of this nature, um, others were able to cut down the amount of time from that hour or 30 minutes down to about 10 minutes per section. So now you have two people doing 10 minutes per section, so 20 minutes and it was done. So from four hours down to under 10 minutes, that was amazing. Again, eliminate uh, adjustments. You use functional clamps. What they, what I mean by that is you're trying to get away from all this wrenching. So anytime you're connecting something, look for the best way to connect it. I mean, go Velcro if you can. 
we had large equipment that we used to have bolted down and we'd unbolt it, move it to a different uh, length change and then bolt it down again. We did some studies and found that because of the weight of the equipment and that it was held together at the different lengths by shafts, we didn't need to bolt it down at all. We left it uh, unbolted to the plate and uh, we never needed to bolt it. Uh, we took it in to the points that it needed to be using jigs and then set up the shafts and everything was ready to go. For some equipment we had it mechanized where you just hit a button and it was electronically set to go into whatever points we needed and we actually had one uh, line that it was a light piece of equipment where it was automated but it was so slow moving we decided to unconnect the electronics and move it in and out by hand and it was very light and easy to do so it was much faster to be done by hand. One of the things that we always want to do is once you've done the videotaping, you've captured all the steps, understand, make sure you understand why each step is done. I've seen old things done before that customers really didn't care about, like old labels on, on boxes for information that was no longer relevant to the customer. They didn't care at all. Um, so there might be steps in your process that were needed two, three years ago that aren't needed today. So you always want to be challenging, always asking why. I'm kind of reminded of the old story of the young girl watching her mom prepare a roast and she asked her mom, how can you always cut an inch off the roast before you put it in the pan? The mother said, well, that's how my mom taught me to do it. Well, the next time the little girl visited her grandmother, she asked her, why did you always cut an inch off your roast before putting it in the pan? She said, well, when we got married, all our pans were small, so I always had to cut an inch off to be able to get it to fit into a pan. Again, we need to know why we do the things we do. So this is another reason to have all employees understanding quick changeover who are stakeholders in the equipment, who interact with the equipment. These are the people that are going to come up with the best ideas. And they're the ones that are going to come up with a red flag saying, you know, we, we do this thing and it really doesn't make sense anymore. Okay, we've already covered the real meat and potatoes, uh, the, uh, you know, the main framework that make up a uh, quick changeover. But I want to uh, just kind of go through these slides lightly. I left them in here mainly for you to be able to see. And um, I, I probably won't read through them, but I'll, I'll have them up there again for your reference. A again, we want to use a scientific approach for our changeover. So after we've you know, identified everything, uh, all the steps, why we do them, um, put them as internal or external, switch as many internal to external as possible, streamline them, then we really want to start over. We've got a new baseline. So we want to now videotape it again and really look at this as continuous improvement. We want to write standards, update our check sheets, and continue to move forward, continue to improve. This just breaks the event down into phases for you. Again, whatever works, uh, it is a good idea to break break it down into steps. And um, this way people can have lots of small wins. Again, you want to be able to always show that you're moving forward. So at, at each step, celebrate your successes and show that you value the activities of the people. Like it says in here, you know, make sure that you're uh, taking advantage of 5S plus 1 and, you know, setting your documentation and celebrating all your successes as you move forward. You definitely want to have champions, uh, people that are in leadership roles that can help b blow through roadblocks that uh, people on the team will run into. And there are always roadblocks. So it seems like you have you know, leaders that are helping to move you forward and then you have those in authority positions that I swear are there just to kind of hold everybody back. So you want people that can champion in leadership roles to help keep momentum moving forward. One of the things that I've seen with uh, Quick Changeover is as people and teams stay involved with this over a few weeks, months, years, they really do gain momentum and they come, become better and better and better at this. So they can walk up to a piece of equipment and notice that, that there's way too much wrenching, there's too many bolts. They can eliminate this, this step or that part. So you do become more intuitive. You become much better at it. So they can identify issues much faster. So you want to keep that momentum going forward. Celebrate successes 
and really help those that are driving these efforts. You want that atmosphere of experimentation. Again, uh, you want employees to feel safe in their jobs. So again, if things don't work out, they're not going to get blamed for it. So again, you're always working with a hypothesis. If it works, great. You know, standardize it, move ahead. If it doesn't work, hey, that's okay. It was just a, a hypothesis. We're going to try something else and keep moving forward. You want to keep this as positive as possible. Again, use pilot programs. So again, you use that one piece of equ equipment or one department. And then as you have a success, uh, word will spread and others will want to duplicate it. Again, I've seen this in, in factories where they've picked one department to do 5S plus 1. And everybody looking at it from the other departments really liked what they saw. And uh, this is one of the factories that I was teaching Lean in. And I had teams implement 5S before they went through the training just because they went and visited the other teams that had already done it. Again, most of this I've, I've already talked about. You have to have good leadership. You have to keep the momentum forward. Lots of celebrations. Have lots of wins. You want to show people that you value everything that they do towards quick changeover. And you want to keep that momentum moving forward. Hopefully you enjoy that and they gave you um, some good insight into what quick changeover is and how to implement it. Again, there's a lot of good information out there that you can find. And as I mentioned before, talk to others who are already doing this. Uh, I found with the people that I worked with at Phillips that the employees, when they started doing this over the years, they became so good at it, so intuitive, that they were able to see where improvements could be made almost immediately when they visited a line or a piece of equipment that hadn't been using quick changeover. Again, you tend to recognize lots of wrenching versus using a clamp or a quick connect. You know, the ability to use, you know, uh, say a mount rather than something you've got to adjust. So uh, as your company and your people start getting experience with this, they will, it will become better and better. Again, we'll never achieve excellence, but we should always be striving for it. Hopefully this tutorial helped you. Please feel free to share, hit like, and subscribe. I'll bring more good lean goodness to you. Thank you and have a great day.